After 15 hours of research and writing, I have compiled a very comprehensive analysis, gendered and race, of the interview that Oprah Winfrey had with Meghan Markle and Prince Harry. And despite the fact that I'm wearing a London crew neck right now, I'm gonna spend the next however many minutes going in on the monarchy. Let's get started. Hey y'all, my name is Raven and welcome or welcome back to my channel. From the title, you gather that today I'll be discussing the Meghan Markle and Prince Harry interview with Oprah Winfrey on March 7th of 2021. So you clicked on this video, you're obviously interested in the topic, why the heck should you listen to what I have to say about it? Here's why. For one, I'm currently a PhD student, which is to say I'm a graduate student in an African American studies department. So I basically spend all day, every day researching blackness, intersectionality, antagonisms, the coloniality of being, and the continually unfolding afterlives of slavery. And I say all that not with the intention of reinscribing some weird academic elitism, but rather just to let you know that I am spending my life researching what it is that I wanna talk with you about today. So. I kind of know what I'm talking about. Secondly, I'm also multiracial like Meghan Markle and the same type of thing. My mom is black and my dad is white or more specifically, he's Jewish. Also, Meghan Markle went to Northwestern for undergrad and I'm currently at Northwestern for grad school. So I just feel like there are all of these really interesting parallels between our lives. I mean, obviously I'm not like a Duchess of Sussex. That's, that's a very clear departure, but y'all get what I mean. <laughs> Because of all these parallels in our lives, I offer a really interesting perspective on this situation because I feel a lot of myself in it. And the third reason you should hear me out is that I've done a very, very thorough research of how people have been discussing what's going on with Meghan Markle. And I think there's a gap in how we're discussing it. A lot of people are offering a racial analysis of what she offered in the interview, but I'm not really seeing a lot of people offer a gendered analysis. And I wanna introduce that into the dialogue. And I do have a background in feminist gender and sexuality studies. That was one of my majors in undergrad and I continue to incorporate that into my graduate studies today. So I think I bring, uh, you know, an interesting socio-political historical orientation to the conversation um, that might be a little bit unique. And with that, let's jump right into the conversation. So any good conversation starts with us all being on the same page. And for that reason, I wanna start with some background information. So here's a timeline of Meghan and Harry's relationship according to Oprah Magazine's website. First, they started dating back in July of 2016 and they announced their engagement on November 27th of 2017. On May 19th, 2018, they were married in front of the entire world, but we actually learned in their interview with Oprah that they got formally married three days prior in a little private ceremony. On October 15th of 2018, they announced that they were expecting their first child. And on May 6th of 2019, Archie Harrison Mountbatten Windsor was born. That's a hell of a name, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, I'm one to talk. My unfolded government name is like a million words, so same. On January 8th of 2020, Meghan and Harry stepped back from their senior royal duties, planning to spend their time between the UK, North America, and the Commonwealth. And before the COVID lockdown started in California, Tyler Perry offered Meghan and Harry and their family refuge, which is so random, but he offered them refuge at his house in Los Angeles and they went there and he also offered them security. They have their own spot now, but they were staying at his location for a while. Keep in mind, during all this, Megan is not being depicted in favorable terms to say the least. In what has been described by her spokesperson as a calculated smear campaign, the British tabloids and media have continually depicted Megan in very problematic raced, sexed, classed, and gendered ways. The Daily Mail, which is a British newspaper, emerges here as a pretty serious slanderer. So on November 2nd, 2016, which is just a few months into their relationship, this writer named Ruth Stiles published this article in the Daily Mail titled, quote, exclusive, Harry's girl is almost straight out of Compton, gang scarred home of her mother revealed, will he be dropping by for tea, end quote. I mean, <laughs> where do we even start unpacking this one? First of all, the fact that the only person explicitly named in this headline is Harry is a violent erasure of Megan and her mom. What happens when we quite literally refuse to name black women? 
Second of all, Megan is described in terms of ownership, getting the title, quote, Harry's girl, end quote, which sort of reinstantiates this very sexist logic wherein there's this masculinist de facto ownership of women. And that takes on a totally different valence considering that Megan is black and white. If we think about the legacies of slavery and the historical realities and relations between white men and black women during those times and how that continues to unfold into the present. By this, I mean there are historically fraught relationships between white men and black women's bodies, wherein black women's bodies were exploited, abused, assaulted by white men to continually perpetuate the, the institution of slavery. Black women's wombs quite literally became the vessels that created more enslaved people more property. So to say Harry's girl and not name Megan and not name her mother is to reproduce a certain kind of historical erasure that is extremely loaded. Not to mention the fact that class is being used here to vilify Megan and her mom in really problematic and anti-black ways. The title insinuates that the criminal activity or the gang activity happening in Compton reflects something fundamental about Megan and her mother. And her mom's name is Doria, by the way. <laughs> This is obviously a very racist insinuation to make and is fundamentally rooted in the historical criminalization of black women. There's this documentary titled The Black Power Mixtape 1967 through 19, 75 and in that documentary we see this clip of Sokli Carmichael sort of touching on this de facto criminality of black people's bodies. So in this clip he's being asked by a Paris reporter because he's in Paris at the time. The Paris reporter says isn't there a possibility that you might end up in jail on your arrival and Stokely Carmichael replies I was born in jail. I think this is emblematic of the de facto criminality that black people writ large experience. And then we see this example as how that manifests specifically for black women. You know, that's that classist, hierarchical, white supremacist bull, okay? And this is just one example of the many media tirades against Megan over the last few years. She has continually been cast to the angry black woman trope. And these stories are not just gossip or entertainment, they have drummed up serious and very real hatred and vitriol that have endangered her and her family members. Death threats, like, it's no joke. Yet another instance of black people's bodies being masqueraded around for consumption without any real desire to enact a kind of care or kindness that's normally afforded for those considered to be human. A modern day Sarchi apartment in a human zoo, if you will. So on March 7th, 2021, Oprah Winfrey interviewed Meghan Markle and Prince Harry. It was billed as a tell-all from a couple now outside the confines of the British monarchy. I mean, that's the sad irony of the last four years is I've advocated for so long for women to use their voice. And then I was silent. Um, were you silent or were you silenced? the latter. So I just want to pull out a couple of the key highlights, a couple of the key things that came up that everyone's talking about that I want to offer my two cents on. So one, Megan opened up about, you know, the pressures of royal life and how it really drove her to a really unhealthy mental state where she was um, considering, you know, suicide as, as a way out. She told us that she sought support from the institution, but she was not given the care that she needed and that caused further decline for her and for Harry. Secondly, we're told that the tabloids have been particularly vicious towards Megan since the beginning of her relationship with Harry, but also that the royal family hasn't really done anything to try and protect her from the press, despite their ongoing and now very public relationship with the British press. We're also told that Megan and Archie were not afforded the same kinds of protections as other members of the royal family, and that there were concerns about how dark Archie's skin tone might be. And the last main point I want to talk about is how Harry was financially cut off from the family. All right, so now that we have a strong background on them as a couple, on Meghan's relationship to the British press, as well as some key highlights from the Oprah Winfrey interview, I would like to jump into the nitty gritty social commentary that's going on and, and what I have to say about it. So there are a few main themes that I wanna hit on. And the first one I wanna talk about is colorism. So the big thing that everyone is freaking out about right now is this part in the interview where Megan says that there were concerns about Archie's skin tone. 
She said when she was pregnant, palace officials spoke to the couple about the upcoming birth of their son, Archie. The conversation of he won't be given security, he's not going to be given a title, and also concerns and conversations about how dark his skin might be when he's born. And these concerns were expressed to Harry by an unnamed member of the royal family, and then those concerns were relayed to Meghan. And so when Oprah asked Harry, you know, who said this to you? And Harry said he was never gonna divulge that because it would be too corrupting for their image. It has sort of started this wild speculation as to who said this racist comment and, and how do we locate that? So what do I think? <laughs> I'm surprised that people are surprised. It is not at all shocking to me that an institution as enmeshed with colonial legacies as the royal family might be harboring some racist ideologies. And it's been really interesting to see how some members of the British press have just like jumped to the defense of the royal family. It almost feels like some members of the press are trying to restore um, this idea of like honor and purity that's attached to the royal family by denouncing any idea that they could ever be racist. No way. For example, we saw Meghan's father, Thomas Markle, speak on the situation on um, the show called Good Morning Britain. And he said, quote, I don't think the British royal family are racist at all. I don't think the British are racist. I think Los Angeles is racist. California is racist, but I don't think the Brits are, end quote. This is obviously an extremely, extremely ahistorical statement to make, considering that like racism literally exists everywhere in the world, hello? And also considering England's very long and ongoing colonial history. We also saw Piers Morgan jump to the defense of the royal family saying that Meghan was just outright lying and how dare she sully their image and how people view them around the world. It doesn't matter whether I believe her or not. What matters is the damage that she is accused of doing to the royal family. And Do you know how much courage it takes to actually speak about racism, to actually call mm -hmm. it out? Do you know what? It's their lived experience and... No, it's not true. Well, that Piers, it's their lived experience that racism isn't always caught on camera. Racism isn't always a black man led on the floor with a white police officer's knee in his neck. Mm -hmm. It comes in all different shapes or forms. I totally what I want to see is the same energy that we had back in the summer mm -hmm. right now. Listen, you might learn something. The royal family as an institution is rooted in colonialism, white supremacy and racism. The legacy's right there. Right, if you stop you shouting, I'll answer you. You're gonna stop shouting? Oh, after you stop shouting. Yeah, let me you constant you constantly use your platform as a wealthy white privileged man with powered influence to Oh, what a load of nonsense, honestly. The biggest what a load of race baiting racist nonsense. And the misogynist what attacks of Megan Mark. Race baiting and you do nonsense. it so shamelessly. We have done That's more. The point. We have done Hey y'all, this is VoiceOver Raven. I'm uh, recording this actually on my phone with my headphones because my microphone is broken right now. I'm not sure what's going on, so I apologize if the, if the audio quality isn't that great, but this will be brief. I just wanted to hop in here and show you some of these clips because these came out after I originally filmed the video. And I was just so, so disgusted watching these interviews. They're about 15 minutes each, so they're quite sizable and I, I obviously couldn't include everything for the sake of time, so I just put in a few little clips. Um, but some things that really struck me were that Piers just wasn't taking Megan seriously at all. Pretty much anything that she put on the table, he was jumping to disprove it or like show how it wasn't valid. And I think this really is like showing that there's a massive problem where black women's feelings are invalidated, black men, women aren't being listened to. And obviously Piers already has a relationship um, to, to, you know, pretty openly and unabashedly uh, shitting on, on Megan in, in, in the media. And so we saw this come to full force in all these conversations that he was having with African diasporic people. Something else that really stood out to me was how invested he was in protecting the monarchy. He says it over and over again, that he's not really concerned about Megan's feelings. What he's concerned about is how this is impacting the vision of the monarchy and how this will be perceived overseas. And so my question is, why are we so much more concerned with how the monarchy is being perceived versus the potential, the strong potential that I believe actually happened, that there are racist sentiments 
in the monarchy, that there are racist mechanisms in the monarchy. Why is that so surprising to people? And why does he feel the need to jump to the defense of the monarchy? And I think the answer is quite simple. It's, it's white fragility. It's the refusal to recognize that covert racism is not always, as Alex so aptly says, someone having a knee put on their neck or gunned down in the street. It can show up in much more insidious ways. And that is actually precisely the technology of racism to continually adapt to the social landscape that it finds itself in. So Piers's absolute refusal to take seriously the claims that are raised in the interview. Also the fact that he's putting all the blame on Megan. Megan is not the only person saying that there are really problematic and racist things that are happening in the institution. Harry is right there with her, endorsing everything that she's saying, standing right by her and offering words of, of support and encouragement to that effect. So why is Megan then becoming the scapegoat for all of Pierce's anger and frustration? There's just something so messed up about that. And this is precisely why I titled this video, Megan Markle is not a sacrificial lamb. Why is she taking the heat for all of this? She went in there with her partner. They went in there as a team to talk about something that's been weighing on their hearts. Something that is, as Alex says, their lived experience. I just wanted to take a minute to highlight uh, how I'm not really the first person saying some of these things. Uh, other folks are also weighing in uh, on the colonial history of the UK and how incredibly ludicrous it is that we're trying to kid ourselves and pretend that it isn't so. Piers really is a classic example of white fragility in full force. Also throughout the interviews, he keeps trying to be devil's advocate. Like I, I didn't have time to put all these clips in, but in the interview with Alex, he keeps saying things like, oh, well, you know, just for instance's sake, say someone wasn't saying it in a mean way. So they were saying it in a very innocent way, simply asking, oh, well, what color do you think the child might be? Well, then do you think that would be different? And Alex keeps sa saying to him over and over again that clearly from the tone of the interview, Megan and Harry are insinuating that it was a negative connotation. It wasn't just an innocent inquiry or comment. There was weight behind it which is to say there were concerns about a darker skin tone it wasn't just a random question not rooted in any you know sort of racist uh, ideology it wasn't just a random question so for peers to continue reinstantiating on that is giving me like serious white boy just to play devil's advocate energy and I i'm really not here for it he also just completely denounced her mental health struggles which she was very candid about voicing in the interview and I think he has since actually been fired. Well, <laughs> that's T. They said that he resigned, but he was fired, right? I believe in freedom of speech. I believe in the right to uh, be allowed to have an opinion. Uh, if people want to believe Meghan Markle, that's entirely their right. I don't believe almost anything that comes out of her mouth. And I think the damage she's done to the British monarchy and to the Queen at a time when Prince Philip is lying in hospital is enormous and frankly contemptible. So uh, if I have to fall on my sword for expressing an honestly held opinion about Meghan Markle and that diatribe of bilge that she came out with in that interview, so be it. The royal family is a visual embodiment of hierarchy, coloniality, elitism, anti-black racism, and whiteness, and imperialism, all wrapped in one. And if you think that all these constructs are somehow in the past and not impacting the present, you'd be wrong. The UK still has overseas territories, colonies, today. Think of the Caribbean, the British Virgin Islands. Now don't get it twisted, I'm not saying that all members of the royal family are evil people and I hate them and I wish ill on them. Not at all. I actually think the Queen of England is really adorable <laughs> despite all this stuff that I'm saying about coloniality. But I do think they are visual representations of a really problematic and continually unfolding history of coloniality. And we have to turn to that history to understand why Meghan and Harry received the treatment that they did. So with all of this in mind, how could anyone rooted in the historical be surprised Surprised that Megan and Harry and Archie were met with racist and colorist discourses about what skin tone Archie would have. In a Medium article published by Ernest and Nebby, we are reminded that, quote, the British monarchy has systematically dissociated itself from its atrocities while benefiting from the spoils and covertly continuing many of the same practices, end quote. 
And I think this systematic dissociation from colonial histories, at least in my opinion, has been highly linked to the royal family's relationship with the British press. And Harry spoke about this in the interview that basically if the royal family complies to all sorts of interviews and stuff with the press, then the press will depict them in a positive manner. It's like a positive feedback loop. And in this way, the royal family is able to control what kind of image of themselves gets projected and they get to have this really positive self image that collapses and erases this really real and ongoing history of coloniality. And this is not unique to England. We see similar phenomena in other countries with colonial histories like Japan, for example, and the rise of kawaii culture as a way to obscure um, their colonial and imperialist histories in Asia. So I came across this article in The Cosmopolitan by this writer named Nyla Burton. And in her article, she basically offers us insights into how Meghan Flight's skin privilege made it even possible for her to marry someone like Prince Harry, but also that that privilege has its limits. So in the article, she says that a black woman with a darker complexion never would have been able to marry someone like Prince Harry, to which I'm inclined to agree. I think it would be very unlikely. You know, I also think something that happens though that I wanna caution us against is when we talk about someone like Meghan Markle, who is mixed race, who is black and white, and identi and identifies as mixed, sometimes in an effort to acknowledge that light skin privilege, we deny their blackness. And so I think we need to hold space for the fact that she has privilege, but also not deny her of her blackness. I wouldn't want someone to deny my blackness because of the way that I look, but also I fully acknowledge and understand the light skin privilege that I do have, and I'm ready and willing to correct and subvert it in every way that I can. And obviously a big part of racialization is how people perceive you. So someone who looks like me, who looks like Meghan Markle, we do experience the world differently because we're not maybe always perceived as black. Maybe someone would look at us and think that we're ethnically ambiguous. In fact, she even wrote about that in an article. So it's all to say, let's hold space for the very real light skin privilege that she has, but let's not do that at the expense of denying her blackness because that is a divisive mechanism that originates from the plantation where this division emerged with mulattoes and we're not gonna reinscribe that here, okay? We're we ain't doing that. But there is privilege there. And um, there's this really awesome tweet that Nyla included in the article that I, I'm gonna put on the screen now because I feel like it really succinctly ties up everything that I'm trying to say. The tweet reads, colorism is what allowed Megan to marry into the royal family and anti-black racism is what forced her out of it. That's the nuance you're looking for. And you know, this doesn't even factor in the colonial logics um, that create anxieties around skin tone to begin with. And this goes all the way back to anti-miscegenation laws, blood quantum theory, the one drop rule, paper bag tests. Even if we think about the British Eugenics Society in the 1930s, they were creating literature saying things like, race crossing was extremely dangerous and half castes should be sterilized at birth. Like these are real quotes. This is seriously disturbing stuff. And so we see this historical fear of racial mixing um, because it disrupts this fabricated idea of white purity. And we see these colonial logics of blood quantums, of racial mixing, of anti-miscegenation playing out on Megan's body and for her son, Archie. So no, I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised that there were conversations happening like this at all. And you know, in the interview, Harry talks about how he feels like a lot of the members of his family are being held hostage by the institution, potentially via their relationship with the press. And specifically he says, there is a level of control by fear that has existed for generations. You know, my mom always told me that you should never operate from a place of fear because action based in fear is dangerous. And what is coloniality if not the fear of losing power? I'm gonna let y'all sit with that. Okay, let's talk about the politics of protection. So in the interview, Megan also tells us that Archie would not be given any kinds of protection or a title and that whereas the royal family was willing to lie to protect other members of the family, they weren't even willing to tell the truth to protect her and Harry and Archie. 
Before this interview, Meghan accused the palace of orchestrating a smear campaign. Last week, the British newspaper The Times ran a report where sources claimed she treated some of her staff so badly that they quit. The palace, which normally is silent on anything published in the papers, said it was concerned about the allegations and would investigate, which it notably did not do over Prince Andrew's sexual abuse allegations. Not only was I not being protected, but that they were willing to lie to protect other members of the family, but they weren't willing to tell the truth to protect me and my husband. And so we get this story that Megan made Kate cry on her wedding because of some debacle regarding a dress that her that Kate's daughter was supposed to wear. And this story gets circulated over and over and over and over again. And this is sort of the beginning of this really intense, colonial, racialized, gendered undertone to the way that we see Megan depicted. And I think this ties, you know, again, into the angry black woman trope. It reinstantiates this notion of white women's fragility. It aggravates tensions between black women and white women that are rooted in very real historical feminist struggles. And we see sort of this framing of black women being assertive as being recast as black women being aggressive. And so that being a, a grounds for dismissal of um, black women's emotionality. And so there's a lot happening with the circulation of this story, uh, which is racializing and gendering Megan in particular ways. Why would an institution built on the bodies, on the assault, on the decimation, on the pillaging of black bodies, turn around and protect a mixed woman's body, a black woman's body. Black women are historically not protected by institutions. And in fact, their continued subjection is the very thing that bolsters institutions and stereotypes. And by this antebellum logic of the one drop rule, Archie really inherits this disdain. He's got a drop, so he's black. A quadroon, to use old timey language. Okay, let's shift the conversation a little bit to mental health. In the interview, she tells us that she was having pretty serious suicidal ideations, but when she told the institution what was going on with her, they did not give her the care that she needed. And in fact, her concerns were dismissed because it wouldn't make the institution look good. She says tabloid scrutiny and life within the royal family made her miserable and lonely. She says at her lowest point, she thought about committing suicide. I just didn't want to be alive anymore. And that was a very clear and real and frightening constant thought. The dismissal of black pain and suffering is not new at all and actually has very real roots in medical racism. Did you know that 40% of first and second year medical students simply believe that black people just have thicker skin than white people? Did you also know that black people are less likely to receive the accurate amount of pain medication that they need to manage whatever symptoms they're experiencing because their doctors assume they don't feel pain in the same way or as much as white patients? Ignoring Megan's cries for help play into this idea of black people just not feeling pain as much or not feeling pain in the same way. And so the institution exposes its affiliation with medical racism in that sense. So let's talk about whiteness and white fragility a little bit here. So Harry tells us that when he and Megan decided to take a step back from their senior royal duties, his security and finances were completely cut off. This was really interesting to me because it seems to illuminate what happens when white people violate the unspoken contract of whiteness. So what do I mean when I say whiteness? What I mean when I say whiteness is a certain orientation towards the world wherein whiteness, white people, white cis hetero men, white skin, are paramount. Whereas whiteness is seen as the essential, the right, the true, the rational center of humankind from which everyone and everything else deviates. And so the unspoken contract of whiteness, in my opinion, upholds this worldview. And Harry violated this contract when he married Megan and pushed against the confines of the institution. And so he's being punished by having some of those privileges of whiteness revoked, namely protection and wealth. 
And the fact that his family cut him off, you know, in a way exposes their own white fragility, to borrow from Robin D'Angelo, which is to say their own anxieties about maintaining their relationship to whiteness, which is to say their relationship to power. And Harry's refusal to uphold those tenets of whiteness and to do so in proximity to them corrupted their own claims to whiteness and thus their own claims to power. In other words, Harry became a liability, so he had to go. Whew, okay, take a deep breath, saw with me. <laughs> okay, that was a lot. We're almost done with the video. And right here at the end, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the digital sphere and how this whole conversation is manifesting on Black Twitter, on Instagram, in memes, and what the significations of those manifestations are. In other words, I wanna end with a turn to social media and I'm gonna show y'all some memes and tweets that I thought were particularly interesting to look at. You know, I definitely have more questions than answers about the impact of these digital conversations that are happening. For example, you know, what does it mean to process the very historically heavy um, implications of Archie being race, class, sex, gendered in particular ways through a GIF? How do we as a people find a way to create comedy and joy and laughter out of otherwise really serious uh, situations of suffering? But also on the flip side, how can memifying a situation minimize the severity and seriousness of it? You know, I don't really have answers to these questions, but I'm gonna continue thinking about them and I encourage you to continue thinking about them as you navigate these digital spaces, whether it be Twitter, Instagram, Reddit, or otherwise. Okay, my friends, this has been a very intense video. It's a little different for me, but I hope that y'all enjoyed it. My hope is that you learned something new and this video stretched your thinking a little bit. I would love to hear what you think about this whole situation, so definitely let me know in the comments down below. I also acknowledge that I don't know everything by any means. I'm sure there are things that I left out. I'm sure there are gaps in my knowledge. I'm sure there are biases in my knowledge because there are biases in everyone's knowledge. So I always welcome loving and respectful critique and offerings that you may have. With that, I'm gonna sign off. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next week. Bye y'all. There's like a ton of cat hair all over my bed and I'm really hoping the camera didn't pick it up. Like look, I just picked that up. But you know, we out here. My mouth is sore from all the talking that I just did. It's like sore. On January 8th of 2020, um, hello? And Harry spoke about this in the interview that basically it's a kind of relationship where the royal family scratches the breath not the breasts. <laughs> Y'all don't even want to know what time it is. It is currently 5.51 in the morning.